Welcome everyone. In part two of this chapter, biosignaling, we will examine G protein coupled receptor based signaling in detail. The beta adrenergic receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. Like all G protein coupled receptors, beta adrenergic receptor is an integral protein with seven hydrophobic helical regions. And these hydrophobic helical regions span the plasma membrane seven times. And thus, G protein coupled receptors are also called as heptahelical receptors. The binding of epinephrine, a small molecule, to beta adrenergic receptor promotes a conformational change in the receptor's intracellular domain, that is on the inside of the cell, that affects its interaction with an associated protein, G protein as shown here in green. Now G protein is a complex of three different domains, GS gamma, GS beta and GS alpha. Now once this interaction of beta adrenergic receptor with the GS alpha is affected because of the interaction of epinephrine, GS alpha results in the expulsion of GDP from the alpha subunit. As a result, GTP comes in and binds GS alpha. Now you have to remember that this GTP is from the cytosolic uh, region or inside the cell. As a result of GTP binding to GS alpha, GS alpha subunit is activated and it separates itself from the beta and the gamma subunits and moves towards adenyl cyclase, an enzyme that is also embedded on the plasma membrane. Once GS alpha interacts with adenyl cyclase, the enzyme adenyl cyclase is activated. Now the activation of this enzyme results in the conversion of ATP to cyclic adenosine monophosphate and the reaction is shown here. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate is a secondary messenger. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate activates protein kinase A which further activates other enzymes through phosphorylation of cellular proteins and this causes cellular response to the epinephrine molecule that originally interacted with the beta adrenergic receptor. In addition, cyclic adenosine monophosphate is also degraded to adenosine monophosphate by cyclic nucleotide phosphodiesterase and this reaction catalyzed by this enzyme dampens the secondary messenger which means that the message is no longer used to activate other enzymes. The epinephrine cascade results in signal amplification. This means that a signal can be amplified into various signals. For example, one signal activates enzyme 1 in this case. Enzyme 1 further activates three molecules of enzyme 2. A molecule of enzyme 2 further activates three molecules of enzyme 3 and so on. And so this amplification is a characteristic property of the epinephrine cascade. Let us consider an example. Epinephrine triggers a series of reactions in hepatocytes or liver cells and in this case amplification of one enzyme results in the amplification of multiple enzymes and how does this happen? The number of molecules amplified by epinephrine is shown here. One molecule of epinephrine can activate 
the epinephrine receptor complex or the beta adrenergic receptor which further activates 10 molecules of the G protein specifically GS alpha. This results in the activation of adenylyl cyclase which converts ATP to cyclic AMP and in this case at least 200 molecules of cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecules are activated. This results in the activation of protein kinase A molecule. Remember cyclic AMP activates PKA. At least 100 molecules are activated by cyclic adenosine monophosphate. PKA further activates PKB or phosphorylase B kinase and this activates thousands of molecules uh, in this case thousands of molecules of phosphorylase B kinase is activated by PKA. Phosphorylase B kinase further activates glycogen phosphorylase B and about 10,000 molecules are activated and glycogen phosphorylase is an enzyme that converts glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate and this involves degradation of glycogen in liver and when glycogen phosphorylase is activated glucose 1-phosphate is formed about 100,000 molecules of them. Glucose 1-phosphate is further converted to glucose which exits out of the hepatocyte cell into the bloodstream and about 100,000 molecules of glucose molecules enter the bloodstream. So one molecule of epinephrine can result in 100,000 molecules of glucose molecules in the sugar. Now the number of molecules shown are simply to illustrate amplification and are almost certainly a gross underestimation which means that one molecule can actually activate more than 100,000 molecules of glucose. So what this means is the typical characteristic of epinephrine to amplify various signals. Self-inactivation mediates desensitization in G protein signaling. Epinephrine is meant to be a short acting signal. The organism must stop glucose synthesis if there is no more need of the fight or flight reaction. right? And the very reason why epinephrine signaling is initiated to have a fight or flight response for the organism. If there is no more requirement of the fight or flight response, the organism doesn't require more glucose in blood. And so it must stop epinephrine signaling. And how can an organism achieve this? Downregulation of cyclic adenosine monophosphate occurs by the hydrolysis of GTP in the alpha subunit of the G protein. And this is one of the mechanisms. And as we examine this, this particular self inactivation mechanism is a part of desensitization or adaptation mechanism that is uh, a part of the cell's response. In this case, a signal that initiates or activates a receptor which leads to a response can be hindered or dampened if the receptor uh, stops the response before it gets amplified. Let us examine the self-inactivation mechanism in G protein signaling. At any instance, when the GPCR or the beta adrenergic receptor in this case is not bound by epinephrine, the interaction between GPCR and the G protein does not initiate a GDP release or a GTP mediated activation of the G protein. And so the G protein cannot activate adenylyl cyclase when there is no epinephrine. When epinephrine binds, this results in a conformational change on the GPCRs, which further leads to 
the displacement of GDP from the alpha subunit of the GS protein. As a result, GTP in the cytosol binds the alpha subunit of the GS protein and once GTP is bound, the alpha subunit of the G protein dissociate itself from the beta and the gamma subunits and moves towards adenylyl cyclase and activates the enzyme. This is the typical GPCR signaling. It so happens that the alpha subunit of the G protein has an intrinsic GTPase activity, which means that the protein can hydrolyze the GTP that is bound to it. And once it hydrolyzes GTP, it results in GDP. And so what happens is GTP bound alpha S becomes GDP bound alpha S, which is now inactive. So once it is inactive, it goes back and interacts with the beta and gamma subunits. And now this is an inactivate, inactivated GPCR uh, complex. Now you have to remember that the GS alpha is a conformational switch, which means that the switch is activated when GTP is bound and switch is inactivated or turned off when GDP is bound. And this is how G protein signaling is self inactivated. Let us examine as to how CAMP activates PKA or protein kinase A. Now, the structure of protein kinase A is shown in this graphics. As you can see, this protein has various different domains. The first domain shown in green is called as a cap or A kinase anchoring protein domain. It has two blue color domains called as the catalytic subunit domains and a red color domain called as regulatory subunit domain. Now the regulatory subunit domain dimerizes at the A cap domain. Now, what happens when the CAMP concentration or cyclic adenosine monophosphate concentration is low? In that case, the regulatory subunits as shown here in red are represented as R, associate with the two identical catalytic subunits. And in this association, as you can see, the inhibitor sequence in the regulatory domain associates with the catalytic domain in the region where the substrate binds. So as you can see, the region where the, the red colored inhibitory sequence binds is a substrate cleft and that is where the substrate of this catalytic subunit usually binds. Remember, protein kinase A is a protein kinase, which means that this is an enzyme that can phosphorylate other protein. Now, what happens to this inhibitor sequence? When four cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecules bind, they bind to the regulatory subunit. So two molecules of CAMP bind to one of the subunit of the regulatory protein or the subunit and the other two binds to the other subunit. And as a result, the inhibitory sequence is moved away from the catalytic subunit. And the result, this results in the catalytic subunit that is now available for substrate binding as shown here. This is how cyclic adenosine monophosphate activates protein kinase A. Now 
A crystal structure of pKa is shown here in this particular diagram here. And here, a part of the R2C2 complex, one C subunit and part of R subunit is shown here. So, this is the R2C2 complex as shown here. And the image that is shown here is what is shown in this crystal structure. And this is an experimentally determined structure of this protein complex. And the blue colored region is the catalytic subunit and only one of it is shown here and presumably it is the one that is shown on the right. The red colored region that is shown here is the inhibitory sequence as you can see that is bound to the substrate binding cleft and this dark red colored region is the regulatory subunit, one of the subunits. Protein kinase A regulates many enzymes downstream in the signaling pathway and this is indicated in this table. Although these downstream targets as shown here have diverse function, they share a region of sequence similarity that is shown here in this column and this region of sequence similarity is around a serine or a threonine residue that undergoes phosphorylation. And these particular sequences marks these proteins for regulation by pKa. This means that because these proteins have these consensus sequence, pKa can recognize them and phosphorylate this serine or threonine in these respective proteins. The substrate binding cleft, if you remember, the blue colored region that we talked about, recognizes these sequences and phosphorylates either a serine or a threonine. Now comparison of these sequences of various protein substrates for protein kinase A has this yielded what is called as a consensus sequence which means that the neighboring residues neighboring residues either on the left side or on the right side of a serine or a threonine is needed to mark this serine or threonine for pKa to be recognized and phosphorylate and that's what a consensus sequence means. There are four mechanisms by which the beta adrenergic response can be terminated in cells. In the first case, the epinephrine concentration drops below the KD of its receptor. Remember, the beta adrenergic receptor has a KD for epinephrine. If the epinephrine concentration drops below that KD, then epinephrine dissociates itself from the receptor, leading to an inactivated GPCR conformation. Again, an active beta adrenergic receptor conformation is required to activate G proteins. In the absence of epinephrine, GPCR is no longer active. This is the first mechanism. The second mechanism involves GTP hydrolysis. GTP bound to the GS alpha subunit is hydrolyzed as a result of the intrinsic GTPase activity of the GS alpha subunit. Again, remember GS alpha is activated when GTP binds to it. Because the GS alpha subunit has an intrinsic GTPase activity, it can hydrolyze GTP. And as a result, GS alpha becomes inactivated because it is now bound to GDP. As this, this leads to the interaction of GS alpha to GS beta and gamma receptors leading to an inactivated GPCR complex. Now, 
the rate of inactivation of Gs alpha depends on the activity of this particular subunit to hydrolyze GTP. Now it so happens that the GTPase activity of the GS alpha subunit is not so high and so GTPase activator proteins or gap proteins stimulate the GTPase activity of GS alpha subunit and this can lead to a rapid hydrolysis of GTP bound to GS alpha thereby inactivating the GS alpha subunit. This is the second mechanism. The third mechanism involves the hydrolysis of cyclic adenosine monophosphate to 5 prime adenosine monophosphate by the cyclic adenosine monophosphate phosphodiesterases. Remember these proteins can uh, convert the cyclic compound to an acyclic compound and this results in the dampening of CAMP signaling. The fourth mechanism is a relatively newer, we have not discussed this, but the metabolic effects of enzyme phosphorylation is reversed by enzymes called as protein phosphatases. Phosphatases remove phosphates from a protein. Kinases add phosphates to a protein. So, phosphorylation is catalyzed by kinases and dephosphorylation is catalyzed by phosphatases. To give you an example, when CAMP activates PKA, PKA phosphorylates many proteins. Now, because of this phosphorylation, further signaling cascades are initiated. Now, to stop those further, uh, further signaling cascades, protein phosphatases remove the phosphate groups from the proteins that were originally phosphorylated by PKA. So, this is the fourth mechanism by which the beta adrenergic response is terminated. The mechanisms for beta adrenergic receptor signal termination that we discussed before takes effect when the stimulus ends. A different mechanism named desensitization damps the response even while the signal persists. Desensitization mechanism of the beta adrenergic receptor is mediated by a protein kinase that phosphorylates the beta adrenergic receptor. So, how does this desensitization mechanism work? Originally, when epinephrine binds the beta adrenergic receptor, this triggers dissociation of the G beta gamma subunit from the G S alpha subunit. Remember, G S alpha uh, gets added to G T P or it binds G T P and gets activated and as a result goes on to activate adenyl cyclase. At the same time, the G S beta gamma subunit that dissociates from the beta adrenergic receptor recruits a protein named BARC. BARC stands for beta adrenergic receptor kinase. Now, BARC is activated by the protein PKA. So, everything happens in cycle. Now, PKA that is activated by cyclic adenosine monophosphate sees BARC as a substrate and phosphorylation of BARC activates BARC and it binds to the GS beta gamma subunit and the GS beta gamma subunit recruits BARC towards the beta adrenergic receptor. At this point, BARC, which is a kinase, phosphorylates some residues, the serine residues near 
the receptor's carboxy terminus as shown here. As a result of this phosphorylation, another protein named BAR or beta arrestin binds to the phosphorylated carboxy terminal domain of the beta adrenergic receptor. Now, binding, this binding interaction is important because the binding of beta arrestin facilitates the sequestration of receptor. How is this sequestered? Um, it is sequestered via endocytosis into small intracellular uh, vesicles called as endosomes. So the arrestin receptor complex recruits clathrin and other proteins involved in this vesicle invagination leading to the formation of endosomes containing the adrenergic receptor as you can see here. In this state, the beta adrenergic receptors are inaccessible to epinephrine because the epinephrine cannot enter the cell membrane and the beta adrenergic receptors are no longer on the cell membrane. These receptor molecules are eventually dephosphorylated by some phosphatases and return to the plasma membrane, thereby completing the circuit and resensitizing the system to epinephrine. This is the desensitization mechanism. And in this mechanism, remember that the beta adrenergic receptors are brought into the cell into endosomes, thereby inactivating them. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate is a common secondary messenger. A large number of G protein coupled receptors mediate their effects via CAMP, both activating and inhibiting CAMP synthesis. The human genome encodes about 1000 G protein coupled receptors. There are also hundreds of different GPCRs that can be responsible for similar processes such as taste or smell. Shown in this table are some signals that use CAMP as second messengers. Now these are ligands that bind to a specific GPCR so as to initiate a secondary messenger like CAMP. Now we looked at the example of epinephrine binding to the beta adrenergic receptors. Glucagon is another example. Glucagon binds to its receptors in the plasma membrane of adipocytes or fat cells activating adenylyl cyclases. PKA stimulated by the resulting rise in CAMP phosphorylates and activates two proteins critical to the mobilization of fats stored uh, in these fat cells. Similarly, another peptide hormone called corticotropin or ACTH produced by the anterior pituitary gland binds to specific receptors in the adrenal cortex. Now, the function of these hormones is to activate adenylyl cyclase, thereby raising the cyclic adenosine monophosphate concentration. As a result of increased CAMP, PKA then phosphorylates and activates several of the enzymes required for the synthesis of cortisol. Cortisol and other steroid hormones are essential hormones in our body. Now these are some of the examples. There are many different ligands that have yet to be identified for many G protein coupled receptors. There are other G protein coupled receptors that use secondary messenger molecules other than cyclic adenosine monophosphate. A second broad class of G protein coupled receptors are coupled through a G protein to a plasma membrane phospholipase C enzyme. Now this enzyme catalyzes the cleavage of membrane phospholipid phosphatidyl inositol. The structure is shown here. Phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate or PIP2 as it is called 
has the structure and phospholipase C or PLC cleaves this particular bond. Now as a result of this cleavage diacylglycerol is released and another molecule inositol 145 triphosphate or IP3 is released. IP3 or IP3 is a secondary messenger like cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So how do these GPCRs function? When a hormone binds to a specific receptor like a GPCR, it initiates a response. Now since this receptor is bound to a G protein, this initiates the release of GDP and binding of GTP to the subunit named GQ alpha. Uh, and this particular subunit is very similar to the GS alpha subunit that we saw for the beta adrenergic receptor. As a result of binding GTP, this particular GQ alpha subunit of the G protein moves to PLC, that is membrane bound, and activates this particular lipase. Phospholipase C, as I said, cleaves PIP2 or phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And the cleavage products are diacylglycerol and inositol 145 triphosphate. IP3 or IP3 binds to a specific receptor gated calcium channel, releasing sequestered calcium. Diacylglycerol, on the other hand, activates protein kinase C that is shown here. Now this diacylglycerol moves along the membrane and activates protein kinase C and protein kinase C is also activated by the calcium released from the calcium channel. So both diacylglycerol and calcium activates protein kinase C and this happens at the surface of the plasma membrane. This leads to phosphorylation of cellular proteins by this particular enzyme protein kinase C and this initiates cellular response to the hormone that originally bound to the G protein coupled receptor. So this is a pathway very similar to the beta adrenergic pathway. Some of the main differences involve the secondary messenger molecules that are IP3, calcium and diacylglycerol. But the response of the hormone binding to the receptor also initiates a signal amplification. GPCRs share universal features. All well studied signal transducing systems that act through heterotrimeric G proteins share common features that reflect their evolutionary relatedness. The receptors have seven transmembrane segments, a domain that is generally the loop between transmembrane helices that interacts with a G protein and a carboxy terminal cytoplasmic domain that undergoes reversible phosphorylation on several serine and threonine residues in this case. In addition, G protein when activated activates another protein that is usually an enzyme which initiates secondary messenger signaling. Now each of this system is similar and yet different. We have looked at the epinephrine receptors in detail and we saw that CAMP is the secondary messenger. And that is true for vasopressin 
receptor as well. But for light receptors like rhodopsin as shown here or the olfactory receptor or the sweet taste receptors, the signaling pathways are slightly different. For example, for the rhodopsin receptor, it is cyclic guanosine monophosphate or CGMP is the secondary messenger. For the olfactory receptor, although CAMP is the secondary messenger, it acts through a different mechanism. 